Oh, great, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, just turn my video on just for the quick introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Our first speaker today is Caitlin Monroe, and Caitlin is an associate conservator at Caring for Textiles, working under senior conservator and owner Julia M. Brennan. After earning her BAA in fashion design and museum, and museum studies minor from Central Michigan University, she received an MFA in costume design and technology from the university, uh, sorry, from Central Michigan University. No, University of Cincinnati College Conservatory Music. My font is too small. <laughs> she had previously done costume work for the Santa Fe Opera and Texas Shakespeare Festival. And Caitlin specializes in historic clothing conservation, and in her spare time, she enjoys researching and sewing curated costumes and accessories using historical hand sewing techniques, and probably makes everything I have ever made in my life look very amateurish. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Gwen, for the introduction. Um, let's get my screen shared. All right. Um, thank you also to WCG for being so flexible and keeping us all safe by shifting this to a virtual event. Today I am speaking to you from Fairfax, Virginia, which is part of the unceded land of the Menahawk. And I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to their past, present, and future elders. In September of 2020, the New York Times published an article, The Incredible Whiteness of the Museum Fashion Collection. Vanessa Friedman calls out the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art specifically. 54 designers are credited with producing items in the Costume Institute's collection that are described as highlights on the museum's website. One third of them are women, four are not white, and none of them are black. They've since made changes and now feature highlights from Black designers Anne Lowe, Stephen Burroughs, Patrick Kelly, and Virgil Abloh. Most of these are important modern designers, but what about a little further back? The Costume Institute will feature three dresses made by Fanny Chris Payne in their spring exhibit in America, an anthology of fashion giving well-deserved national recognition to this amazing designer. Fanny Chris was born in Cumberland County, Virginia in 1866 to a formerly enslaved couple. She was the youngest of seven and the first of her siblings to be born free. As an adult, she would eventually move to Richmond and become a well-known and reputable dressmaker. No known written newspaper advertisements exist for her business. She only needed word of mouth, mention of her name in society pages and let her fine dresses and impeccable craftsmanship speak for itself. She made dresses for many of Richmond's elite society women. Today, there are only four known dresses attributed to Fanny Chris. All are in the collection at the Valentine in Richmond. Kristen E. Stewart, the Valentine's Natalie L. Kloss, curator of costume and textiles, first featured one of Fanny Chris's designs in the Valentine's 2018 costume exhibit. It was around that time she discovered there were others in the collection. Some of the museum, some were in the museum database under the last name Payne, and others Chris, her maiden name. Three of the four dresses contain a silk twill waistband stamped with Payne. Richmond, Virginia, a signature of an artist. She labeled her fabric confections for the world to remember her name. Kristen wrote a chapter for Black Designers in America entitled Dressing Up, The Rise of Fanny Chris. I highly recommend this book if you're interested in fashion or learning more about Fanny Chris than time permits today. In 2017, Caring for Textiles treated this dress made by Fanny Chris, worn by Ellen Scott Clark Wallace and featured in the Valentine's uh, 2018 exhibit. I was fortunate to work on this dress and it was my initiation in getting familiar with various sewing techniques and materials that Fanny liked to use. 
Little did I know at the time that I would be fortunate to conserve two of her other dresses and my work on the first dress would prepare and inform me for a successful outcome with the other treatments. Though there were many unique challenges in treatment of the other two dresses, this silky confection presented the most challenge. This dress was made in 1905 for Nanny Moore Ellison Crump, daughter of James Taylor Ellison, who served in the Senate of Virginia as mayor of Richmond and later as the state's lieutenant governor. In particular concern was the state of the bodice yoke area. When the dress first arrived in the studio, we weren't even really sure how successful any of our attempts to stabilize and untangle would be. The embroidery was jumbled to unrecognition and 99% of the ground fabric was lost. With what very little was left, it could be determined that the fabric was a very sheer fine silk. I recognized the shards as a material that was also used in two of the other dresses in various ways. Digital microscope comparison and analysis confirms this. Each area where the fabric was used has differing degrees of loss and damage, but the almost total loss of fabric in the yoke seemed to be the worst. I believe the damage here occurred at a faster rate in part because of the location, right next to the skin, where there was a higher chance of exposure to body oils and perspiration. Because of the high profile exhibit, aesthetic considerations were at the forefront of the conservation treatment. It didn't just require stabilization, but needed to look beautiful and whole in a way that would honor Fanny Chris's design. The initial idea for treatment was to encapsulate and stabilize the embroidery in a way that would prevent it from further tangling or coming loose, and then create a facsimile overlayer that could cover the distracting mess underneath. Anything else felt too daunting, an impossible task to return the mess back into anything close to its former glory. But maybe it was possible. I felt that it wouldn't hurt to try a more restorative approach and see what could be done with what little seemed to be left. As I worked through this treatment approach, evidence of original construction of the yoke and embroidery design revealed itself. In the first step of the treatment plan, I had to make a fabric support structure to which the embroidery, the, the loose embroidery threads could be stabilized and stitched in place too. For fabric choice, our best suited options were either silk crepeline or silk organza. Even though silk crepeline was much closer to the level of opacity and structural quality of the original silk, I decided that silk organza would be a better option. It offered good dimensional stability, and although it has slightly less opacity, it still remains in the spirit of Chris's vision. Next was to figure out the support structure. It was important to get the pattern shaping as close to what was originally there as possible, but with 99% of the original fab ground fabric gone, I was worried that this could not be accurately determined. Was there a collar? I knew this decision would have a major effect on the appearance of the bodice, so I looked for any material evidence that would suggest what direction to go in. What style of neckline or collar did her other three dresses have? All three dresses had a high stand-up collar, which was popular during the narrow time period that all four dresses span from 1904 to 1907. This evidence, this is evidence that a collar on this dress was maybe also possible. What about examining for any physical evidence on the dress? There are four collar stays, two at either side of the center back opening and two at either side of the neck. Photographed are the two at either side of the neck, very tangled up in the embroidery thread. Because of these reasons, I thought it was very likely that the bodice had a collar and speculate it would have been at least as wide as the length of the collar stays. This graphic shows the approximate pattern of the fabric support yoke and collar, though it's not exact or to any scale, just for general understanding of the shaping that I would need to do. I created the collar support by draping and pinning a long piece of silk organza. 
along the remaining silk satin neck edge, shaping where necessary and then trimming back to allow for an appropriate seam allowance. It was at this stage that I was able to spend a little time figuring out how well the embroidery thread would untangle. Since I had the organza collar in place, I could arrange and pin the loose embroidery to this support. This was when I realized there might be more embroidery intact than what was initially thought. Next was figuring out how, accurate, how to accurately shape the front yolk and the back yolk pieces. I understood that the, what the general shaping needed to be and had good alignment in all areas of each piece that would connect to the bodice except for the shoulder seam. Even though the bodice has a lace overlay that extends into the shoulders, I could not rely on an accurate measurement from this area. The layers almost totally unattached from the front of the bodice. It's simply pinned to the bodice at these decorative silk bows, meaning its position is adjustable and this was, it's possible that this was not the original alignment. I thought all was lost until my next discovery. This is the area that I made my breakthrough. To orient yourself, the photograph shows the interior of the top shoulder area. I was busy untangling and trying to make sense of the mess of embroidery threads when I found something that was not quite like the others. This is one of the embroidery threads. And this was formerly the shoulder seam. Before this photo, they were very jumbled up and tangled. Um, this uh, shoulder seam, I could tell what it was because they're two intertwined threads that have a crimp pattern that was their stitch memory. When I examined the other shoulder area, mixed up in the tangled embroidery threads were the same intertwined crimp threads. From this point, I was able to sh shape and stitch the support yoke with relative ease, knowing that it would be more accurate than anticipated. With the silk organza yoke support fully stitched in place, I could get back to untangling and ar arranging the embroidery. I slowly worked through sections and pinned them in place to the finished support. The embroidery design revealed itself in a natural and obvious way. Oop, back. It was fortuitous that Fanny Chris selected the feather stitch as her main choice of embroidery. By nature of stitch mechanics, the feather stitch has a short traveling stitch on the underside of the fabric. It's because of this, I was able to arrange, coil, and stitch the thread to the surface of the support fabric in a way that mimics the feather stitch appearance. With the loss of the ground silk, each line of feather stitching was very spring-like or like a slinky and had just enough stitch memory left for reshaping. The first graphic shows the mechanics of the feather stitch. The center photo shows a small section of the center front feather stitch embroidery that was intact. And the photo on the right shows the stabilized embroidery coiled and stitched in a way to mimic the feather stitch. Remember the collar before? Here it is at a much later stage, still in process, but a majority of the embroidery has been stitched in place to the support fabric. The horizontal threads were originally so twisted up in the feather stitch coils that it was hard to distinguish their pattern, but everything came together as I sorted, pinned, and couched the embroidery threads. Here I have moved on to stabilizing the front yolk area. I was able to arrange, tension, and pin all the silk cords that extend from the center feather stitch line. It was fortunate that most of these threads were still attached to this portion of the vertical feather stitch. I was able to follow their angled trajectory and stitch couch each thread in place to the support. In the end, this is the only area that had a few missing silk cords, which were not replaced. All the embroidery you see here is original to the dress. It was truly awe-inspiring to see Chris's delicate design come back to life. And here we have our end result. The bodice came back together better than I could have imagined. It was honestly one of the most challenging but equally rewarding treatments I've worked on. 
sometimes there's more remaining material evidence than meets the eye. And it just takes thoughtful and careful examination and a lot of patience. I think I ended up spending at least 200 hours on just the yoke of, and collar area of this bodice. And the rest of the dress is still undergoing treatment. I believe having the background knowledge and costume history, historical pattern making and a strong sewing skills was an essential part of the success of my treatment. And because I know we all love a satisfying side by side before and after, sometimes you really can make something from what seems like nothing. It has been an incredible privilege to work on this dress and I hope I was able to honor her legacy. I'm thrilled to have been able to share the extraordinary work of Fanny Chris with you today. I wanna to give special thanks to Julia Brennan, Kristen Stewart and Washington Conservation Guild. Thank you. Caitlin, that is such a fantastic treatment and you must feel so satisfied about Very how that has gone. Yes. Excellent. Um, while we get a couple questions and make sure to check out the chat, Caitlin, for um, any comments, I did want to introduce the Washington Conservation Guild's president, Jane Holt, who has a couple announcements. And then we'll return to questions for Caitlin as they come up uh, before the second talk. Thank you. And, and here we are to Jane. Hi, everyone. I'm so I, I don't actually have that much to say right now, um, other than to that I am so glad that you are able to join us and I am I'm just heartbroken that we're not meeting in person tonight. So I was really looking forward to that. It was such a difficult decision for us, but I'm, I, I'm sure everybody uh, understands why we had to make the decision that we did. I do wanna thank our wonderful sponsors who um, have supported this meeting. They also were planning to be here in person so that they could meet and talk with you all. Uh, it was uh, AIC, Gaylord, Herox, Hollinger Metal Edge, Small Core, Talus, TrueView, and University Products. Um, Gaylord actually donated a, a huge uh, gift crate for the raffle. So we're going to save that for uh, what we hope will actually be an in-person meeting in May, our business meeting when we have a raffle then. So please, please, I hope you can join us then. We're going to see if we can find an outdoor venue so we can all meet in person. Uh, and then the only other thing I want to say is to remind you that we are breaking our three ring into three different nights. So this way you can actually see everybody's talks this year instead of having to pick and choose. Uh, our next talk will be um, January 13th, and that will be Ring 2, Technical Imaging and Scientific Research. And then January 20th will be Ring 3, The Great Beyond. So that's, that's all I have to say, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the rest of the talks. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, it looks like we only have just overwhelming words of appreciation and congratulations to Caitlin. Uh, but if we have some more questions, we can um, bring Caitlin in back at the end of tonight's session. So to our next talk presented to you by Elizabeth Robeson, who is currently the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow Conservation Fellow on a joint project between the Chrysler Museum of Art and Hampton University Museum, and she's focused on contemporary African art. She was a postgrad fellow at Colonial Williamsburg for two years after obtaining her master's degree in paintings conservation um, from SUNY Buffalo State College. She has also worked at the Ringling, Muse Ringling Museum in Sarasota, Florida, the St. Louis Art Museum, the Mariners Museum, and the International Platform for art research and conservation in Brussels, Belgium. And a quick fun fact about Elizabeth is that she plays the bassoon, just like the actor Rain Wilson. Um, take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Gwen. Share my screen. Um, and thank you to the Washington Conservation Guild for the opportunity to discuss this very interesting painting treatment that I worked on for about a year. Uh, my presentation is entitled Treatment of the Portrait of William Henry Capers by Ralph Earl. When less is more, still takes time. 
For some brief background, Ralph Earl lived in the latter half of the 18th century. He was an itinerant artist in New England for the part of his career when this work was painted. He had just been released from debtor's prison in New York City and was transitioning to a more rural life in and around Connecticut. The book pictured on the right by Betsy Kornhauser provided much of my initial research and understanding of his life and materials. This is the painting before treatment as it arrived in the lab. It's of a standard 18th century size, about 30 by 36 inches, and depicts a seated figure with a view of a few buildings behind him. There are two inscriptions which identify both the artist and the sitter. The top detail is of the artist's signature, which reads Earl Pinkst 1788. And the calling card the figure holds says William H. Capers, Greenwich, Connecticut. William Capers may be the only person from the South that Earl painted since he was studying in Connecticut at the time, but soon returned to his home in South Carolina, likely bringing this portrait with him where it appears to have descended in the family until it was purchased by Colonial Williamsburg in 2020. The portrait arrived in fairly poor condition and records indicate that it may have been rolled up and stored for a number of years. It had obvious broad areas of overpaint, the significance and extent of which only became apparent during treatment. The planar deformations due to the poor lining can be seen in the specular light image on the right. The painting had been lined in quite an atypical manner likely in the mid 20th century based on the materials. There was a paper interleaf between the canvases, which had a dark reddish brown adhesive on the surface facing the back of the original painting. The non-original commercial stretcher, though keys were present, had been turned into a fixed strainer with the addition of four large brackets in the corners. Long wave ultraviolet examination revealed some of the overpaint more clearly including in the face and parts of the hand and coat, but what was going on in the background was still unclear. Luckily, the facial features were largely untouched and it appeared that the overpaint often covered original paint based on crack patterns that could be seen under magnification. I also processed several film X radiographs which were stitched together into the composite image on the right, which shows the rough and uneven ground application, the impostoed brush strokes in the linens at the center, and um, losses of paint and ground, which appear black and hard edged and are quite minimal overall. These are all of the treatment steps and analysis that I completed, but today I'm gonna focus only on the black uh, portions here. I tested um, various solutions in order to remove the varnish and chose a mixture of one part ethanol to two parts shell sol D38. The first stages of cleaning in the figure went as expected. And then in the background to the right of the sitter, original tan and brown paint were revealed below heavy brown and black overpaint. I continued cleaning in this area, confident that though the tonal shifts were somewhat large and the initial cleaning was uneven in places, there was integrity to the paint below. Here's an overall half cleaned image on the left and a detail of the face, which shows the change in the coloration created by removing the yellowed varnish. In the pants, folds and highlights were revealed in an area which had previously appeared to be a flat black. The paint here is somewhat abraded, but still reconstructable. Here's the same half cleaned state in specular light and UVA radiation, which shows how the red cloth actually fluoresces a bit as compared to before treatment. This pigment was not conclusively identified or characterized, but it is likely of organic origin or a mixture. Then as I continued cleaning above the sitter's head, the underlying color shifted to green rather than brown over here. I was surprised but confident that I was removing overpaint and revealing original paint based on the presence of fly specks and areas of damage that the overpaint had covered. As I cleaned the town scene and sky, the edges of two green shapes revealed themselves below purplish and greenish blue overpaint. Closer up here is a detail during overpaint removal in this area. This was another hint at the huge compositional change which had been created by past restorers. Working carefully under the microscope, I found that there were two distinct layers of overpaint in the sky, a purplish one on top, which was more continuous and widespread, and a lighter bluish one below, which had a crack pattern in it and was not present everywhere. 
I determined that both of these were not original, though one had clearly aged longer and been partially removed in the past. I continued cleaning, saving this difficult area until I fully understood the painting's solubility parameters. For the more stubborn overpaint in the upper left quadrant, I used a buffered gel, which I applied to the surface in small sections, agitated it with a brush for several minutes, and removed it with dry swabs, finally rinsing with pH-adjusted water. Eventually, an abraded but clearly defined tree with branches and various colors of leaves was revealed. In order to help with the interpretation of this and other aspects of the painting, I was fortunate to be able to visit nine locations and examine 47 other paintings by Earl last summer on a research trip. It is clear that Earl often uses the same shorthand technique to create the form of trees, outlining leaves with broad semicircular brush strokes over a flat field of greenish brown, which appears to be very thin and therefore vulnerable to harsh cleaning. This can be seen in houses fronting New Milford Green, which is at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, as well as in this portrait of Marianne Wolcott at the Litchfield Historical Society. This painting in particular contains trees made with a similar technique, but a variety of background colors, which drastically changes each one's appearance. From this, I recognized the need to closely examine what remained of the original paint in William's tree to recreate the tones and depth that Earl had originally intended. Next, in order to decide what level of structural work this painting would undergo, I had to determine if the lining could be safely reversed. Though it wasn't actively delaminating, it was poorly done, creating planar deformations that were deemed unacceptable for display. Since the canvases were so stiff, it would have been hard or impossible to improve these at all in its current state. It was secured to a fixed strainer, which was flimsy despite the added brackets and lacked a crossbar to support the structure. So to test the solubility of the reddish brown lining adhesive on the back of the original canvas, I took samples of the paper interleaf from the edges and tried to dissolve the adhesive in various aqueous solutions, solvents, mixtures, and gels, but nothing seemed very effective, mostly breaking up the paper substrate, if anything. Uh, after further testing, I found that heat did seem to weaken the adhesive. So we decided to proceed with a lining reversal after careful testing and then facing the front of the painting so that it could be safely removed from its stretcher and laid face down. The lining canvas peeled off of the paper interleaf nicely, but the adhesion of the paper to the original canvas varied greatly. Some areas peeled off quite easily in large chunks and I was able to use a thin metal spatula to separate the layers quite quickly. Other areas were much more well adhered and required heat to soften the adhesive while applying mechanical action. So I created a custom shaped heated spatula tip in the center to help relax the adhesive and get between the layers at the same time. Here is the bulk of the lining about halfway removed on the left and me working away on the right. Once I finished the bulk of the lining removal, I found that there was still a significant amount of adhesive residue on the back of the canvas, which I felt could affect the adhesion of any new lining materials, and also was likely contributing to the continued planar deformations in one area. I started to test solvents to soften the adhesive using Evalon CR as a carrier. I found that a mixture of hexanes and isopropanol four to one was the most effective at softening the adhesive. So I started applying this to the Evalon and left it on the canvas under mylar and weight for about 10 minutes, replying more solvent if it seemed too dry. However, this procedure was determined not efficient enough and it also had an effect on the facing varnish. So instead I focused on mechanical reduction of the residues using a scalpel or metal spatula held perpendicular to the canvas. Here you can see on the right how many of the dark residues have been reduced. I also discovered that a crepe eraser picked up already lifted residues quite well. The images on the left show the same area in raking light before and after the use of the crepe eraser. I did use the solvent removal technique in one strip along the top edge of the canvas where there was a possible original material like a ground applied to the back in a scattered pattern. Um, and I did not want to disrupt this. Uh, I also used the solvent technique in the area of the greatest planar deformation, which worked very well to relax the canvas. 
And so in case you've been wondering what this adhesive could be, Colonial Williamsburg conservation scientist Kirsten Moffat was able to characterize it with FTIR using samples I took from the back of the painting after the bulk lining removal. It fits most closely with known spectra for neoprene or polychloroprene, which is synthetic rubber. This is sold today in cans like this one and the marketing claims that it gets stronger over time. So I do think it was good that we were able to reverse the lining and remove many of the residues now. Moving on to more of the structural work, here is one of two very small tear mends that I completed using Tengujo Japanese tissue and dilute Jade 403. Since the bulk of the original canvas is not compromised and I did not want to hide all of the original canvas back, which I had uncovered, I decided to proceed with an edge relining. I started by preparing strips of linen using liquid Biva 371B. I also added Biva, Biva to stable tex, an open weave polyester fabric, which is applied to the edge of the canvas and extends the grip of the edge lining further into the canvas plane, increasing the strength of the edge lining, particularly since there are no original tacking margins. I also decided to add a mostly transparent loose lining to the stretcher using stable tex by creating a border of Biva on the stable tex seen on the left to be tacked to the back of the stretcher. In the future, I would add Biva to the area, the, um, area of the tacking margins as well, right here. Um, which I'll explain more in a moment. And on the right, you can see me priming the edges of the original canvas uh, with liquid Biva as well. Here's the back of the canvas just before the next treatment steps. And as I mentioned, um, I first adhered the loose lining to a new custom stretcher, which had been ordered from Simon Liu. It was further custom fit to the slightly skewed painting dimensions with the addition of mat board strips to two edges. The stable tex was secured to the back of the stretcher by using a tacking iron to reactivate the Biva border. Then the strips of stable tex and linen were adhered to the back of the painting itself. And the painting was aligned on the stretcher and tacked with push pins. The blue board corners seen on the right ensured that the stretcher was kept in alignment while tension was applied. Any excess material was folded underneath in case the need arises to restretch the painting in the future. You can see here that the tacks were applied around the outer edge on the back rather uh, than the sides as usual. This was done in order to avoid tacking through stable tacks which had not been coated with Biva since I was afraid that this could create a run over time and this is where the wider Biva border would have been useful. But it all worked and here is the painting finally upright again. Um, next, varnish tests were done with various concentrations of MS2A resin, and an intermediate mixture of 20% in shell sol D38 was selected. Here is the painting after varnishing in normal and specular light. And here is the back with the new edge lining and stretcher, showing that we kept as much of the original canvas visible as possible. Here are some details of the fills, which were done using Fluger acrylic spackle and were fairly minimal. Due to the texture of the canvas and ground, many losses did not require additional fill material. Here are some key areas before in painting with Gamblin conservation colors in the eyes and the cuff here. And here they are after in painting. And here are the larger areas of the figure's hand and face before in painting and after. Um, finally, here is the upper corner showing um, before treatment, the dark and stormy sky effect. Uh, the after cleaning and revarnishing, revealing the damaged tree and after selective and careful in painting to reintegrate the worst of the losses and abrasions. In this overall before and after comparison, you can see how the composition is lighter and more balanced overall as Earl intended. This treatment was incredibly challenging, taking about 700 hours in total, but it was ultimately quite rewarding. The lining reversal took about 130 hours and overpaint removal had been almost 200 hours of careful work under the microscope. But it has ensured the longevity of this painting and returned it closer to its original intended state. I have many people to thank for their assistance and guidance during the scope of this project, especially Shelley Svoboda, and I think I consulted each and every one of the other conservation labs at CW at some point during this treatment. 
for my research trip, I met with, corresponded with, and consulted with so many people as well, uh, even more than I could list here. So many thanks to all of you, and thank you to the audience tonight for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Congratulations, Elizabeth. What a transformation that is. Um, we're going to just wait a couple of minutes um, while some questions might come in. Come in. Um, and I do have to say that I am very jealous of the sheer amount of stable text and MS2A that you had. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I for was, that treatment. Yeah, I was uh, thrilled to have it. And I know it's not always available, but use it when we can. And especially for a surface that had such a history like that one did the use of MS2A really probably had such a great impact on that and your ability to in paint and blend those surfaces together. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, I do, um, well, in the meantime, because I know um, it takes a little while to gather your thoughts, um, we, if we get any more questions, we will ask, um, ask them too at the end of the session. Uh, but here we have from Terry Masso. Let's see here. Um, was the painting exhibited and can you tell us anything about the original frame if you had the original frame or the framing for the piece? Yeah, so let me share again really quick. Um, I actually have some pictures. So the painting came in not, we don't have the original frame, unfortunately, but we did have this frame is what it came in. Um, it, a really poor um, 20th century frame, very minimalist. It's kind of, kind of just a scoop, very, very thin um, frame that was not appropriate for this painting at all. So um, the furniture lab at CW constructs beautiful frames. So uh, here's a quick shot. I don't have the final photo, but this is um, the, a test of fitting it into its new frame made by Chris Swan. Um, from Colonial Williamsburg and the profile was based on both his research and then the research that I was able to do um, on my trip uh, to see paintings um, at, at various institutions and uh, yeah and then on the right is uh, showing how I, I added some spacers and created a padded backing as well um, to support this canvas further. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, um, we'll say goodbye right now, um, Elizabeth, and introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you again, Elizabeth, for that talk, um, Janelle Batkin Hall. Um, Janelle is an objects conservator in private practice and a graduate <coughs> of the Buffalo State Art Conservation Program, where she specialized in archaeological objects and cultural heritage materials. She's currently an objects a contract conservator for the National Air and Space Museum. And before that, was an Andrew to be Mellon Fellow, Foundation Fellow at the National Museum of African Art. When she is not working in a museum, you will find her working on site at several archeological sites. And in the green room, she mentioned that the use of drones actually is something that <laughs> is coming in today. But, but um, our fun fact for mm -hmm. Janelle, and this is very exciting, she collects Victorian era human hair art and is a hair weaver who utilizes traditional hair work techniques into her own artwork. And I look forward to someday taking some lessons from her in that. <laughs> um, so Janelle, please take it away. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much and thanks for having me here. Um, I'd first like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded lands of the Piscataway tribe. I acknowledge the Piscataway community, their elders, past and present, as well as future generations. I'm really excited to present the conservation and preservation strategies for two royal Kushite tombs at the uh, site of El Kuru in North Sudan. I'll discuss treatment specifics, provide uh, practical information on material sourcing and the work conditions in rural Sudan. I'm presenting this paper on behalf of my co-authors and fellow Kuru conservators, Pamela Hatchfield, Jan Katahar, Eve Mayberger, and Kemi Burs. Between 1800 BCE 
A new Kushite dynasty developed near the fourth cataract of the Nile River. The Kushite kings ruled from Napata, the region surrounding Jebel Barkal, which is a sacred mountain where the Egyptians believed their state god Amman resided. The Kushites con conquered Egypt and ruled the region during the 25th dynasty. In 2003, UNESCO designated this area the World Heritage Region of Jebel Barkal and the sites of the Napatan region, Sudan. At El Kuru, um, it is known to uh, have a royal cemetery where many of the 25th dynasty Kushite kings and queens who ruled Egypt were buried. The site includes a sizable pyramid of an unknown king, a mortuary temple, royal tombs, and many small finds which are housed at the Sudan National Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, or MFA. The focus of this talk is on the rock cut painted tombs of King Tanwatamani and his mother, Queen Kalhata. They are richly painted and among the best preserved Kushite tombs. And a fun fact is that Sudanese pyramids were created earlier than the Egyptian pyramids. And there are around 2000 Kushite pyramids compared to 200 or so Egyptian pyramids. <clears throat> Although Al Kuru um, was looted in antiquity, archeologist George Reisner of, the, of Harvard University and the MFA excavated the site in 1919. Reisner was invited to undertake this project by the governments of Egypt and Sudan who were under British control at the time. Reisner was one of the first archeologists to employ scientific documentation and photography to his fieldwork practice. In 2013, Dr. Jeff Emberling of the University of Michigan and Dr. Rachel Dan of the University of Copenhagen started the International Kuru Archaeological Project, or ICAP. An MFA-led team of conservators returned in 2019 to perform stabilization, develop strategies for visitor access, and determine long-term preservation recommendations. Uh, this recent aerial photograph of El Kuru shows how close the archaeological site is to both the Nile River and the modern village. This 3D image indicates uh, what the burial pyramids look like in antiquity. And here's a present day drone footage of the site. The pyramid structures were not disassembled by looters, but repurposed by Kuru inhabitants during the Middle Ages to enhance the city wall. I have a video here created um, to show the tomb. Um, unlike Egyptian pyramids, Sudanese burial chambers are not located within the pyramid structure. Instead, they are subterranean chambers. The Kuru tombs are carved into the sandstone bedrock approximately 45 feet underground. Neither of the rock cut tombs have its original pyramid superstructures, though the subterranean chambers remain remarkably intact. A long staircase leads to a tomb that is comprised of two uh, rooms, a smaller antechamber that leads into a larger funerary chamber. The walls and ceilings of both tombs are elaborately painted with funerary imagery. The painted walls consist of sandstone bedrock covered with plaster, then a white pigment ground, and finally, painted decoration using earth pigments. The imagery of Kalhata's tomb shows her entering the antechamber holding the hands of the children of Horus. In the funerary chamber, she is presented with an ankh or key of life and goes through the stages of rebirth. Blood damage to the lower registers of the painted walls is apparent in both tombs and most of the painted surface is now missing in those areas. Condition assessment. Um, in 2018, MFA conservators spent several weeks at Al Kuru addressing issues relating to visitor safety, environmental monitoring, condition assessments, and developing a treatment plan. The Reisner photographs were important records to qual quantify damage sustained in the last century. Note the loss to the lower register of the painted surface and the abrasion of the cartouche that was um, here and is now missing and much of the detail is now missing. And this is where the ankh was. Um, the structural integrity of the sandstone walls has been compromised by the inherent fragility of the stone 
physical abrasion and impact, and the effects of moisture. Original adhesives and media used in the plaster substrate and painted decoration attracted significant insect activity, which undermined and weakened the surface. Condition assessments were done with annotations on, print, on printed photographs while in the tombs. This information was later digitized. The condition assessment also included written documentation, photography, and previous imaging and pigment analysis undertaken by our Kuru colleagues. Initial testing of treatment approaches and materials was carried out at the MFA to inform the treatment plan for future seasons. Collaborative decision-making played an extremely important part in our process. We worked closely with different stakeholders, including senior Sudanese cultural officials, archeologists, architects and engineers, and the people who lived in the modern village of Kuru. This level of support and local involvement remains incredibly important during times of civil unrest and uncertainty in Sudan. In 2018, an environmental monitoring plan was implemented to assess condition issues, monitor insect activity, and ascertain the potential effects from visitors. Much of the noted damage in the tombs was associated with the uneven floors. People would touch the walls to steady themselves as they moved between the different chambers. To address this issue, Taipar landscaping fabric was laid down and covered with smooth river stones that were sourced directly from the nearby Nile River. The site architects manufactured several steps and railings between the chambers in both tombs. These simple measures have not only improved access, but also mitigated several of the risks to the painted walls. The reality of working in rural Sudan required careful pre-season planning, conversations with local contacts um, along the creative problem solving, along with creative prob problem solving and um, compromise. The treatment materials were selected for their long-term stability, reliability, and ease of application. Wherever possible, materials were sourced in Sudan. However, certain items were obtained in the US or elsewhere. MFA conservators transported about 330 pounds of supplies from the US for the 2019 season. Fortunately, most of the materials and equipment is currently stored on site for future work. Before moving on to the treatment specifics, um, I'd like to share some comments relating to the materials and equipment. Locate, locating and sourcing appropriate conservation mortars proved especially challenging. Although assured that natural hydraulic lime was available in Sudan, we have not been able to successfully source it. Given the restricted time frame allotted for treatment and uncertainty about sourcing the material, we decided to Im import conservation grade mortars from the US. Void span mortar systems, which are prosolanic hydraulic lime related products were selected as a suitable alternative. Workability and the minimal use of moisture also factored into selecting this product. Currently, there is no reliable electricity in the tombs. We use long extension cords attached end to end across the open desert to connect the electrical um, grid in the village. We were fortunate to have local electricians help us maintain a working power supply. To augment the lighting conditions, we brought two portable battery powered Draycast LED lights. The LED lights generated minimal heat and used rechargeable batteries. These lights were essential as the tombs were very dark when the electricity was not working. The subterranean nature of the tombs created sauna like conditions with little air movement. Given the solvents needed for treatment, sourcing a portable and affordable extraction system was imperative. To this end, we brought an Allegro exhaust fan and Granger lay flat ducting. The ducting only inflates when the fan is turned on and the negative pressure brings fresh air into the tomb. Despite being noisy, the system functioned very well and the, when the electricity was working and was used at least for a few hours each day. It should be noted that this entire system can be disassembled and transported in a single check bag on a commercial flight. For the 2019 season, we prioritize the stabilization of the more poorly preserved tomb of Queen Kalhata. 
The treatment focused on stabilizing the sandstone walls and plaster substrate, consolidation of the powdered ceiling paint, removal of insect debris, and limited removal of silt residues. Stabilization and preservation took precedence over aesthetic issues, although legibility of the wall paintings was also a priority. The plaster substrate was riddled with channels created by burrowing insects. This necessitated the stabilization of the, vo of the voids and exposed edges. Many plaster edges required immediate attention in order to mitigate against potential material loss. Before any mortar was used, the fragile sandstone was consolidated with a 2.5% solution of butbar B98, a polyvinyl butyl resin in ethanol. After adequate drying, void span injection grout was introduced via syringe into voids behind the intact plaster. Void span crack filler was applied to the edges of the exposed substrate and insect channels. Mortar was mixed in a ratio of five to one filler to water and it's color adjusted using dry mineral pigments. The stabilization of the plaster substrate proved to be the most time intensive part of the treatment. And here's some of the fills during the treatment. And this is a section of a wall after treatment and um, the loss edges, um, they were filled like in here, we backed up behind the voids, the insect uh, voids and channels were filled in in these areas. Egyptian blue pigment on the ceiling was severely underbound and much more friable than initially anticipated. The seaweed-based consolidant trifunari showed promising results during testing in 2018. However, it proved insufficient to consolidate the powdery Egyptian blue in the tomb because the concentration needed would clog our sprayers. After additional experimentation with consolidants available on site, we used 7.5% solution of gum arabic in water. After two applications of gum arabic using um, and nebulizing mist sprayers, the Egyptian blue was successfully consolidated without any noticeable darkening. It is important to note that previous analysis indicated that gum arabic was the original pigment binder used. Unsurprisingly, the tomb had significant contemporary and historic insect activity. Mud wasp nests and spider webs and egg sacs were prevalent and visually distracting. The debris was carefully softened with ethanol and or water soaked swabs or brushes, and the material was then removed via mechanical action. The lower sections of the antechamber walls were obscured by flood uh, silt residues. In light of the tomb's notoriety and the significance in attracting visitors, the Sudanese National Corporation for Antiquities and Museums, or NCAM, requested that we improve the legibility of the wall paintings. Given the limited resources at hand, prelim preliminary cleaning tests were undertaken. Despite the effective pigment consolidation elsewhere in the tube, tomb, the friable reg pigments required additional stabilization. Unfortunately, the gum arabic in Butfar B98 did not effectively consolidate the red pigment and the silt could not be safely removed using water. To satisfy NCAM's request for improved legibility, we tested an alternative cleaning approach. The silt on the more stable white background was removed while leaving the silt on the red pigment untouched. This created a, a visual contrast between the background and the painted scene, making it more readable. We would like to emphasize that these test results were only preliminary, and it remains to be seen if this approach will work in other areas. Preventive conservation is always preferred over interventive treatments, which are normally cost prohibitive for archaeological sites and should be approached as a once in a generation endeavor. Any intervention should thus ideally be durable while keeping within the tenant of retreatability as stipulated by conservation ethics. Because of this, conservation records and documentation are of paramount importance for the sustainable management of the site. Our primary recommendations relate to simple measures pertaining to levels of access and limiting the number of visitors in the tomb at one time. 
The ongoing political upheaval in Sudan and COVID-19 pandemic further complicates long-term planning and future funding sources. Elkru is a significant cultural heritage asset that is anchored in a rich archeological past. The conservation of the painted tombs during the 2019, 18 and 19 seasons is the result of a concerted effort by local, national and international stakeholders. Most of the friable sandstone and painted surfaces in the tomb of Kalhata have been stabilized. We anticipate extending a similar preservation strategy to the tomb of Tanwatimani and look forward to its unique challenges, such as whether or not to remove black mold stains visible on the painted walls. Ultimately, it is hoped that by sharing practical treatment strategies, these measures will enhance visitor safety and contribute to the long-term preservation of these painted royal tombs. The ICAP team has developed a wonderful relationship with our host family over the past nine years. And in addition, the entire village, some of whom hold critical important roles as excavators, collaborators, electricians, tour guides, and caretakers of the site. This closeness and collaboration extended to all aspects of the project, and we certainly benefited as a result and enjoyed it immensely. The sense of Working together is seconded by creativity, expertise, and hard work. The Sudanese are the, some of the most generous and kind people I've ever met, and we hope to be back on site with our friends and colleagues very soon. I'd like to thank our colleagues and our Sudanese hosts and WCG for organizing this event, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, lovely. Thank you very much, Janelle. Looks like we already have a question from the audience. And as a reminder to all of our um, audience members, you're welcome to enter questions in the chat for all of our speakers. We do have one for Caitlin that we will be addressing. Um, so first, uh, we have a question from Whitman Proctor in Texas. They, um, first of all, the 3D images are amazing, and they would love to know any recommendations you have or specific sources for the nebulizers that were used. Um, I think those were picked up um, by our colleagues in the Netherlands, but I can find out what brand they were and see if they're, if you can source them here in the States. Um, yeah, they were brought over from the Netherlands. Okay, great. Um, and that's something that you can always um, include in comments. This video will be posted to WCG's YouTube page as well. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. So I'm um, uh, just Wally. Okay, we got one more from Wendy Rose. Um, thanks for the presentation. And uh, were there any measures undertaken to prevent future insect infestation? Um, we didn't set traps because um, the site is active with visitors. Um, we do have people checking constantly in the tombs for us and letting us know. Most of the insect activity appeared to be older. Um, so right now, just with the Sudanese caretakers giving us updates, uh, that's all we have. We had anticipated being back for 2020, but because of COVID, that's not happening and it's not happening this year. So um, yeah, it's sort of a see what, you know, see what we can do when, when we can um, to have people actively watching the site for us. Yeah. 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 And active, active monitoring um, can often go so much further than doing anything um, uh, else like spraying and so forth. It's so much more benign. Um, right. Joanna Baker, <laughs> Joanna Baker asked um, how often the chambers flood and if there are any measures to mitigate any potential flooding. Yeah, um, so I think the last time it flooded was prior to the 1919 um, excavation by uh, Reisner. Uh, it's not that often, um, but it can happen. And especially with, uh, there was a dam built several years ago, not far from the site that is causing the um, water table to rise. 
in the area and humidity to increase. So that is a constant um, threat. Uh, but it's, it's an archaeological site and sometimes nature is going to take hold and it's underground and there's, there's not much we can do to keep yeah. it from rising. But um, yeah. so luckily there hasn't been a flood very uh, in the past at least 100 years. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, it looks like we um, are almost out of time, but I wanted to make sure that we were able to ask Caitlin a question that we received from Kira Teeter uh, about the Fran um, Francis Fanny Chris dresses. And um, is that dress representative of um, uh, the projects that you had? Were there other similar projects to that or new challenges in the collection? Um, all four were similar in some ways. So for example, they all are lined with a silk, very um, not untypical of the time period is shattering. So it, I, yeah. they're, they're worn by four different women. So they have unique wear patterns to the lining and unique shattering patterns. Um, so similar in that way, but of course it, each one requires a slightly different approach. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Janelle. And thank you, Elizabeth, so much uh, for sharing your research and your work with us today for WCG Streaming Circus. Um, I hope everyone stays safe, stays warm. Thank you again.